Okay, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Today we'll be discussing hair loss, male and female both. Um, when we're talking about hair, um, on an average, um, men and women lose about 50 to 100 hairs per day. Over our entire body, we have about 5 million hairs, men that is, not women as much, and on our heads between 100 and 150,000 hairs. Um, when we're talking about the causes of hair loss, huh, they're numerous. I have people, uh, customers that come into my stores and they say, I'm losing my hair, what do I do? And boy, there's a series of questions that we kind of have to figure out between us, their physicians, proper testing to determine what the cause of their hair loss could be. Um, genetics, uh, it plays a big part, particularly, particularly in male pattern baldness. Um, when we're talking about uh, by age 40, two-thirds of Caucasian men on an average uh, start losing their hair. So, uh, you know, when we start usually that midlife type of thing with males and then midlife uh, for females as well, which we call menopause or perimenopause, we often see uh, hair loss as well. Um, hormones generally as a rule for females tend to be a major cause of hair loss, particularly involving progesterone levels. Genetically, women can have issues with uh, hair loss as well, grandma or grandpa, but we see that much more genetically prevalently passed on uh, along the male lines. Um, for men, uh, particularly, and females as well, when we have an over uh, DHT production driven by something called 5-alpha reductase, which is produced in the prostate, in the adrenal glands, and believe it, directly in the actual uh, hair follicle itself, then this actually can convert or convert testosterone into dehydrotestosterone, and hence you'll see your hair loss. This is what we see with male pattern baldness. There are things that speed this up, and we'll talk about that a little bit further, um, but one of the major causes is we get uh, an excessive uh, sebum buildup in the scalp itself. And remember I had noted that this 5-alpha um, reductase is also produced in the scalp. Well, when people tend to eat a higher fat, higher sugar, higher junk food diet, then that causes that, um, the, the follicles to get clogged. So you get a higher uh, sebum buildup, and then the 5-alpha reductase builds up, and then the hair falls out, basically because it can't get any circulation or any nutrients. So e eating excessive amounts of animal fats, keeping the sugars high, having poor uh, circulation to the scalp, uh, and then genetic history, uh, which is the ultimate culprit, but the contributing factors are the, are the uh, diet, the high levels of, of animal fats. And actually, literally, there are certain types of shampoos or conditioners that you can use on your hair that can cause the blockage uh, of, of the hair follicles and increase this uh, sebum content. Uh, there's a chemical called sodium lauryl sulfate, which is what they clean jet engines with. And if it's not coconut derived, it's kind of like battery acid to the scalp. So it just kind of damages the follicle, causes the, the, the fat buildup, and then you lose your hair. So if you have any shampoos with uh, sodium lauryl sulfate, propylene glycol, chemicals that you kind of can't identify, um, then I would be very aware, aware that that could be a contributing, contributing factor to your hair loss. Stress, uh, illness, and autoimmune diseases. People who have, all of a sudden get sick, their body becomes under extreme physiological or psychological stress, will sometimes lose hair by the handfuls, and that's a, a form of alopecia, alopecia meaning hair loss, uh, caused by these items. Uh, pregnancy and menopause, um, because of progesterone changes or increase in testosterone when you're pregnant with a male baby, uh, can cause uh, hair loss uh, to some extent. Progesterone, particularly in menopausal and perimenopausal women, when the levels drop off, uh, then we end up with this, particularly since environmentally we are very estrogen dominant from all the chemicals and the pesticides, we end up with the low levels of progesterone and women start combing their hair and they're seeing not the 50 or 100 hairs down the drain, they're seeing the 200 or the 300 on a daily basis and the hair starts to thin and we all kind of panic. So there's things we can do about that and we'll talk about that later on down the road as well. Um, drugs medications, prescription drugs in particular, 
majorly can contribute to hair loss. Um, I had one lady come in, her son was on Accutane, 17 years old. His hair was falling out by the handfuls, obviously because high levels of vitamin A and extreme high levels of uh, vitamin A in the Accutane had caused his uh, liver to not uh, be able to properly function. He would, hormones uh, don't properly um, get excreted or utilized and he was losing his hair. Um, cholesterol drugs, ulcer drugs, tagament, um, blood thinners, um, certain types of birth control pills, uh, gout drugs, beta blockers can cause, uh, beta blockers meaning for high blood pressure can cause hair loss. Antidepressants, uh, steroidals, particularly those used uh, in a non-prescription form, in other words, illegal steroids. Uh, uh, you'll see a lot of the uh, uh, drugged bodybuilders using steroids, they'll lose the hair and they, they're 25 and they look like they're 50 um, because the steroids will increase that dehydrotestosterone uh, production. So they'll lose their hair. Hypothyroidism. Um, most people generally know about hypothyroidism when they're in their 20s and 30s, but oftentimes hypothyroidism can be triggered by the lack of progesterone, other factors, excessive amounts of dental uh, x-rays in which the thyroid has exposure um, causes then hypothyroidism, which means an underactive thyroid. Uh, under those circumstances, women will lose their hair and males as well. Not as frequently, I see it more so with women, but uh, something that a physician can test for uh, and we'll talk about the testing procedures uh, further on down the show. Uh, crash, fad diets, or gastric bypass. When you all of a sudden lose weight, dropping the fat off more than a pound, pound and a half a week, uh, as oftentimes it happens with gastric bypass, we see extreme hormonal um, uh, fluctuations. And when you lose, tend to lose fat, you tend to release tons of these um, estrogens and they cause your hair to fall out, progesterone levels uh, drop off. We see this a lot, particularly in females that undergo crash diets uh, or gastric bypass. So slow progressive weight loss uh, is always the best way if you don't want to have hair, uh, hair loss. Nutritional deficiencies, sorry I misspelled nutritional. Um, nutritional deficiencies including B vitamins, uh, biotin, just overall mineral deficiencies, uh, protein deficiencies, will cause you to lose hair or have hair that's thin and of not of good quality. So a good nutritional program and a diet that's high in vegetables, whole grains, enzyme rich foods, nuts. Now the types of foods that tend to contribute as we noticed or uh, noted already, animal fats, uh, hydrogenated fats, those are all types of things that will contribute to uh, the sebum buildup as well. So diet, as far as nutritional deficiencies, as well as uh, actually contributing as far as the blockage on the sebum, disrupting hormones, uh, animal fats and hydrogenated fats disrupt hormones, which can aid in a bit hypothyroidism, progesterone deficiencies, those types of things. Poor scalp circulation. Remember I talked about like the sodium lauryl sulfate and some of the heavy conditioners we use on our hair? They can contribute to poor circulation to the scalp. Um, lack of exercise, lack of movement, um, not having good blood flow uh, to the scalp can also contribute. So uh, that circulation in the scalp, you know, this obviously has to have blood getting to it in order to grow. So if you have blocked hair follicles, it's not going to get the blood that's necessary to feed uh, the hair itself. Um, parasites and mites. There are um, mites that can, and parasites that can grow under the skin that can damage hair follicles. And a good physician uh, with a proper um, uh, testing biopsy can determine either uh, topical mites or intestinal parasites. The intestinal parasite tests are about 50%, but it gives us some, something to go on to see whether or not somebody is, is suffering from a parasitical infection intestinally wise. Um, heavy metals, those people working uh, around heavy metals in computer operations or anything to do with metal as far as, um, oh my gosh, uh, electricians, plumbers, uh, any industry in which you're working in around heavy metals, 
and you're seeing hair loss, I think it's a good idea to pluck a few of those hairs and get it sent off for a hair analysis to find out if maybe you might have a uh, heavy metal exposure. That is one of the testing procedures uh, that can be utilized uh, for hair loss as well. Um, syphilis and sexually transmitted di uh, diseases, including gonorrhea. Um, anything in which your body is continually trying to fight off an infection and with some of the strains of syphilis now, nowadays that are antibiotic resistant. Um, a uh, major uh, contributing factor if, if, uh, if, in, uh, if, if left untreated or if it is not treatable, it will cause uh, hair loss as well. Um, if you are losing hair, um, I usually suggest that people get a hold of their doctors and have a full panel thyroid test done, which includes a T2, T3, T4, and TSH testing, not just the good old thyroid hormone stimulating test, but a complete panel, which is anywhere from about 25 to 50% accurate. Intestinal permeability tests to see whether or not you have something called leaky gut. Are you absorbing your nutrients um, available by your physician? Vitamin and mineral analysis. A heavy metal, as we uh, described, and vitamin and mineral analysis can be done with blood, uh, hair, and urine. Uh, and then, obviously, when you lack iron, uh, iron is what helps us carry our, our uh, hemoglobin, our, our oxygen, I mean. And when you carry oxygen, obviously, you feed circulation uh, to, the, uh, to the hair itself, or the hair follicle. Um, I'd like to discuss some of the supplements that are available that can slow hair loss or strengthen hair or increase circulation to the hair follicle itself. Uh, Salpimento extract, which is utilized a lot for um, uh, dehydrotestosterone types of, of uh, exposure, um, 300 uh, to 400 milligrams of salpimento extract can help with that conversion on the 5-alpha uh, reductase. Omega 369s, those are the good fats in the diet, and you can take them in a supplement form, or if you're doing organic nuts, including walnuts, almonds, and pecans, they help stabilize the hormones. They reduce inflammation because uh, there are also disorders on uh, hair that can be um, inflammatory. Uh, psoriasis, a form of arthritis, will form on the scalp sometimes. So they become very inflamed. So increasing these good fats in the diet reduces inflammation. It also helps to carry out some of those bad fats, uh, the sebum. Uh, biotin, I have a, a really wonderful uh, beautician. We have a, a great one here. Her name's Odile. And she sends her uh, clients in to pick up uh, biotin to help strengthen the hair. And biotin, which is considered in the B vitamin class itself, can help strengthen the hair and help with hair growth. Iron, um, we tend to lean more towards food sources of iron or supplements that are food source based uh, if you're iron deficient. Uh, ferrous sulfate is a, they take old scrap metal, chemically alter it, and they say, here, here's your iron. And it only has about a 10, 15% absorption. So if you're low iron, contributing to hair loss, look for more of a food source um, iron. There's whole food um, irons. There's blackstrap molasses irons, iron biglycinates that you can utilize for that. Um, vitamin C with collagen matrix. Obviously, this is going to have some collagen formation with protein. So vitamin C is very helpful for uh, hair strength and hair growth. Uh, MSM also, uh, together with vitamin C, helps with the collagen matrix and can strengthen the actual hair uh, itself. FOT. Uh, FOT is used by oriental medicine doctors, oftentimes in combination with other uh, oriental medicine uh, herbs to help slow hair loss and recommended dosage is anywhere from uh, about 500 milligrams three times a day of faux tea. Relatively safe with taken with other medications, but if you're concerned, you can always go online and see if there's any contraindications with your uh, medications. Silica or Biosil. Um, these can strengthen hair. Actually, we use it also in, in uh, in joints and with bone health uh, or bone breakages because it makes for a stronger bond uh, in the cells. And so silica or biosil can actually strengthen the actual hair itself. Rosemary oil. 
It's just an essential oil that you buy for what about five, six bucks. And what you do is you take the oil, three, or, three to five drops per, um, I think, an ounce or so of shampoo, put it in your shampoo. And rosemary oil helps increase circulation. Or before shampooing, you can take a few drops, rub it in your hair real good, really circulate it in the scalp. And it helps take off some of that buildup and also increases the circulation to the scalp. Um, natural progesterone cream. When women are going through menopause and perimenopause, and as noted before, they oftentimes have a drop in their natural progesterone levels and with very environmentally uh, estrogen dominant in our food source and everywhere else. Um, Dr. John Lee did most of the studies on that. When we add in progesterone cream, we see hair loss slow and actual, I know me personally saw actual hair increase with utilization of uh, natural progesterone creams when you're not in balance. Uh, zinc and copper, uh, and you want to, whenever you take a zinc, it's always a good idea to take a copper balance. They work together. You can offset your uh, levels of zinc and copper if you don't take them together. Uh, aids uh, with hair growth. Uh, digestive enzymes. Uh, if you have poor nutrient absorption, you don't digest very well. Enzymes, or there's also something known as probiotics, acidophilus bifidus, those good bugs, those good bacteria, can help you break down those nutrients to aid with um, nutrient absorption. Uh, a good multiple vitamin and a B complex. <clears throat> with today's food, and I was in agriculture for a lot of years, uh, the quality of the food as they, as they throw on very few things onto the crops just to make them green and bloom, uh, is pretty nutrient deficient. So nowadays a really good multiple, and I mean a good multiple, not something that's going to come out and be in the septic system. Uh, a good multiple vitamin with extra Bs can be very helpful for hair loss. A lot of the hair, skin, and nail formulas that are out there will be a, a multivitamin that's got extra B vitamins and oftentimes some combinations of some of these other items as well. Super greens. Now you can either eat super greens in a food source, which are um, broccolis, um, and preferably organic, once again, because we're trying to avoid the chemicals. Broccoli, green leafy lettuce, anything that's green oxygenates and increases circulation. If you're not a good veggie eater, it helps with fiber and everything and enzymes, but there are uh, some helpful things such as uh, chlorella, spirulina. A lot of people do their wheatgrass uh, shots. Uh, anything that oxygenates in greens will help with, uh, with uh, hair growth and prevention of hair loss. Sublingual B12. We um, have people who have poor digestion, especially in the lower part of the digestive tract, or people who have gastric bypass. Uh, oftentimes will be B12 deficient. And there's just a simple sublingual under the tongue, meaning it melts, takes 10 or 15 minutes to melt, can help with uh, hair uh, loss prevention as well, particularly in those gastric bypass patients. Other contributing factors that we see to hair loss are lack of sleep. Um, be gentle when you comb your hair out, especially when it's wet. If you're sitting there and you're just, I mean, going to town and you're looking at your brush or your comb, you're like, whoa, be gentle. If you do have hair that's difficult, use a detangler, you know, but be gentle to your hair in that regard. And then once again, as noted before, use good products. Those that don't have sodium lauryl sulfates are a long list of chemicals. The more basic, the better, uh, as far as cleansing is concerned, because you're not trying to, uh, you want to remove deposits, you want to clean the scalp, but you don't want to strip the hair, and you don't want to strip, strip the, uh, the scalp. Next, we'll be moving on to our uh, fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. Today I'm going to show you a couple of uh, stretching exercises that you can do with your kids, particularly um, as long as they're not complaining of severe pain, but if they're complaining that they're, you know, they're just kind of achy on their back, there are certain movements that we can do uh, safely, which will never substitute for chiropractic, that I would like to show you that a good uh, bone doctor showed me, a bone specialist. Uh, that can be helpful, they can utilize with your kids or someone that's smaller than you. You don't want to try this exercise on someone bigger than you. You'll hurt yourself. So, what we do, um, this is to try and stretch out 
the uh, lower lumbar region and uh, I've done Augie a few times so we probably won't hear any loud pops but, but occasionally you'll hear a little bit of a popping as as the spine gets back in alignment what you do is you latch arms with someone smaller than you and you use your butt in their back to their back and Augie you got to relax up against here and you bend slightly and you lift them up just very gradually, very slowly, and let them back down again. And that can pop that lower back kind of back in again. Once again, not a substitute for chiropractic, but it can help with little minor things. Uh, another one uh, that this great physician, his name's Dr. Blackburn, showed me, is uh, you cross one arm like this across the shoulder, one arm like that across the shoulder, and then the person who's bigger in size uh, uses a little bit of leverage. You get their knee under their butt. You cross your hands like this. I'll keep it tight. But you tell them to relax at the same time. And what you do is you just lean back. You do not put full force on your own body, but you're just leaning back. And if they're relaxed, kind of lift their feet off a little bit, you'll have a little bit of popping and it can keep them in alignment. That'll do it for our fitness portion of the show. Um, next, we'll have our research analyst. Welcome back to the Fit and Healthy sh uh, Today show. Um, with us today is research analyst Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you. Now, here's a good question for you. Would you take a product that reduced your chance of having a repeat heart attack by 45%, reduce the chance of total mortality down by one third, and not only that, unlike this is verified, now remember this study is published in the 15th edition of the American Journal of Cardiology, but I'd still like to see it verified, cancer mortality by two-thirds. Well, yes you can, and it's readily available as a food spice. The spice is called Chinese red yeast rice. It's been consumed for thousands of years, very effectively, with no known reported side effects to date. Now again, all studies need to be verified in order to be credible. One good study does not make it the, the rule. Sometimes it could just be the exception. However, though, from the American Journal of Cardiology, they reported, and they did the study with 5,000 people between the ages of 18 to 70 over a five-year period in 60 hospitals. In their own words, they said the results were so profound, even outperforming statins prescribed in numerous Western populations that further studies should certainly be investigated. Something that we shall be investigating ourselves, especially taking some of the other medications that are out there. Now, following up, as the researchers found out from the University of Germany of Ulm, there's one interesting product you usually hear quite a bit about from grapes, wine, red wine especially, and that is resveratrol, or resveratrol, I should say, I apologize. They discovered it actually reduces the number of fat cells in the body, which is something incredibly unheard of. And most interesting also, they found, it seems to reduce certain cytokines, especially cytokines which are basically related to developing certain obesity disorders, and also diabetes, among these other things like clogged arteries. It is really, really a neat substance which seems to be really cool. Now what they said was this, and their quote again, is resveratrol has anti-obesity properties by exerting its effect directly on fat cells, said fischer Pazowski, which is one of the main researchers. Thus, resveratrol might help to, develop, to help prevent the development of obesity and might be suited for treating obesity on its own. Very cool, very interesting, something else that also be picked up, but I also recommend always research on your own too. Another one that came out for weight loss, which is real intriguing, this one just kind of uh, caught me off guard. This one came out of the Endocrine Society's 90th Annual Meeting in San Francisco. And this was done by the Research, or I should say Smell and Taste Treatment and Research Center of Chicago. What they are called is taste-ons. Taste-ons are nothing more than something that heightens the flavor of food. And the reason this has such an interesting effect is it actually seems to reduce body weight just by enhancing the flavor of certain food. They took 2,436 overweight individuals, which are weighed about an average of 208 pounds a piece, 
and over a six month period of time, they just gave them something. They didn't have restricted calories, they didn't change their diet, they didn't do any of that. Each person on average lost an 30 and a half pounds on average. In fact, it was so effective they had a hard time keeping people inside the study because they were reaching their ideal weight, body weight way prior to the six months occurring. And all it was was just basically heightening the flavor of food, whether it be sweetness or saltiness, which kind of surprised me. And then there's basically they said total they lost an average of 15% of their body weight the results showed. Very interesting very intriguing and they said it's something that you could do on your own totally just by basically enhancing the flavor of certain foods which I found very interesting and simple to do. Outside of that now for more of the warning signs. Is drinking tap water safe for pregnant women? Well out of the Institute of Occupational Environmental Medicine at the University of Birmingham out of Britain they looked at 400,000 infants and they looked at birth defects and also local water supplies they discovered that the chlorination of the water caused, directly related, holes in the heart, cleft palate, and also caused neural development to basically fail or break down, in addition to missing the top part of the skull or the skull cap. And interesting enough, again, it was all related to the levels of chlorine in the water. Now the sad part about it is, in the United States especially, there are other ways to purify water, like ozonation and other atoms like that that we do through the rest of Europe, which we can do here. Why we don't do it, I don't know. In fact, the EPA out here recommends that you can have as much as four milligrams of chlorine per liter of water. Amazingly, in your swimming pools, they don't recommend you do any more than one to three milligrams per liter. Very interesting. And then, my favorite segment, as I'm gonna start calling it, is what were they thinking? Well, this one goes out to Kellogg's. Kellogg's decided to make candy in the shape of Legos. I'll just read you a quick quote since we're kind of limited on time because this words it up the best. I would love to know what sick person at Kellogg's came with this genius idea. I just spent the first three years of my son's life to try to get him not to eat blocks and now you're telling him they taste like strawberries. Thanks a lot. Seriously, how in the world does this ever get past our legal department? You can't tell me that this is a lawsuit just waiting to happen. I can only assume that your next product is going to be fruit flavored thumbtacks. Well, that goes out to Kellogg's and what were you thinking? I got no clue, but I recommend don't get your kids started on candy flavored Legos. It'll save a whole lot of grief in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. I hope once again that this show inspires you to do further research and look into changing or doing whatever you need to do to make your life better. Thank you very much.